Well, welcome, friends, to the periodic table of history. This is where we study history in four dimensions, and this topic is kind of interesting and very controversial. It's about giants, and it's something that I came across in the study of Britain, and I wondered how far or close to reality that might be. So remember, we study in four dimensions, so this is a three-dimensional map that we can move around the Earth with. When we're talking about Albion, we're talking about Britain, currently now United Kingdom, and then our fourth dimension is the time axis, and that is here. We get our equilibrium, so we have Israel going down this way through time, and then we're going to be talking about British history, and that's going to be over here. We have our uh, 6,000 years of history, and that takes us from the beginning, which that's going to be up here. I'll put a, a circle there and then zoom in. So we're going to we look at Adam. And in this case, uh, Britain goes all the way down to Queen Elizabeth II is the current monarch of the United Kingdom. Actually, it used to be called Britain. And it was called Britain after Brutus, which is right about right here. So we'll zoom in to, to him at about uh, 1100 BC. Brutus, Britain, in the previous video, we talked about uh, the bloodline of Britain and how he came from the Greeks, from the Trojan War, and then to the Italian Peninsula and off to, to uh, the southern islands. Aeneas actually fought in the Battle of Troy and then makes his way back to the Italian Peninsula. And it's in the Italian Peninsula. He makes war there, etc., etc. Um, you end up with Brutus. And then Brutus is kind of a piratey leader kind of a figure that uh, makes his way around the Mediterranean up and into Britain. So we have the relation between Britain and then the Italian Peninsula, uh, Troy, I always like to relate that to the history of the Hebrews, which uh, this is a little bit before the time of Saul and King David. When we go back to one of the earliest writers of Britain, we get to Nennius, and he writes the Historia Britannum, and he's talking about the dispersion of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So we're working with the Japhethetic line. We also can go in here to this connection point because the thing that is most curious is what the text says here. It says, uh, when Brutus landed, he saw giants, and he says, they therefore passed through all the provinces and forced the giants to fly into the caves of the mountains. That's always something that makes fascinating literature. But then in Holinshed's Chronicle, we see that there is a genealogy. It's this blue line that runs back to Samothes. All right, so there's Samothes, and Samothes is somehow related to Japheth. And we do get this genealogy from Holinshed's Chronicle, so I'll put that up there, and it's just fascinating to see it in the original text. Holinshed writes a little bit about Samothes and then Albion, and says, Wherefore the former denomination after Samothes did grow out of mind. The new name was Albion, as we see here. So that is the relation. And then we also have the other genealogy to Brutus uh, that's also a descendant of Japheth to somehow. But the interesting, real interesting thing about, about this line, when we talk about Samothes and Albion, is, is that they are a race of giants. See, I'll put a little circle kind of right there so we can remember that that's where uh, Samothes and Albion are. So when we start talking about giants, this whole line is that, as I, as I showed you in the Chronicle. So we're looking at that really narrow blue line. I'll put this other tracer here so we can remember that. So, so now we know what we're, we're talking about. And reading about giants from the literature from long ago, then I started asking, well, are there other examples of these? Can this idea of giants be compartmentalized? into part of my understanding. So you can go to Josephus, and Josephus talks about Goliath. And I'll put a circle there where about Goliath would be also. 
probably a little bit after this time because the, the time of Saul is, is about 1050 and a little bit onward closer to 1000 BC, uh, then going into, well, then going into David. Uh, so that's where Goliath would be. And then, you know, this was 1100 BC, just about. So we're talking about 50, 100 years after Brutus and the encounters with the giants. So it seems like uh, this theme shows up quite a few places, and Josephus has this to write about it. Uh, Josephus here says, For he had a breastplate on that weighed 5,000 shekels, and that converted into our weight is 126 pounds. So a little bit hard to do a marathon in. But also a helmet greaves of brass, large as you would naturally suppose might cover the limbs of so vast a body. Uh, so it goes on giving some descriptions there, and you can read that. Pause the video if you want to read those kind of things. Uh, and then the story of David and Goliath. Josephus is just a little bit graphic there, right? This stone fell upon his forehead of Goliath and sank into his brain, insomuch that Goliath was stunned and fell upon his face. So David ran, stood upon his adversary as he lay down and cut off his head with his own sword, with Goliath's own sword. So these are kind of things that we see in Scripture, and that is a um, something that to the rationale that has never seen a giant then has a really big problem with. I study the Bible quite a bit to, to where I accept these uh, spiritual-minded kind of things, themes like giants and miracles and things like that. And so to me it's not that big of a deal, but to anyone who wants to impress the university, not going to get any weight with thinking about giants. Uh, but going on in, in Genesis, we can look through the, the Hebrew, uh, looking for a collection of ideas of, of this theme of whether there's any weight to giants for, to, to substantiate the, the British collection of them. So when we go into uh, Genesis chapter 6, we start hearing about God talking to Noah and giving descriptions. In Genesis 6, 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And this word is Nephilim, uh, something that's been a fascination to anybody that's chasing these kind of things down. You can probably see lots of video talking about Nephilim that have uh, graphic renditions of these giants and feats and uh, things that you might see in ancient literature. Uh, but there it is, the, the word for giant, and that's where that comes from. It's a Hebrew word. Um, when we're talking about Noah, he spent... Oh, about 600 years before the flood and 300 years after the flood. So, uh, so this description in Genesis 6 would have been given before the flood. Now, uh, special something that we have to make note of, it says, and also after that. Because that's another thing to hope that uh, these giants of old, we don't have to deal with them now, or we don't see them now because they were of old and, and uh, out of our thought process, out of our conscience. Uh, but yet, in fact, that extra phrase, and also after that, starts giving more plausibility to the Nephilim. Yes, yeah, so we know that right off the bat in Genesis 3, God reveals his plan to save humanity by the seed of the woman, because there's a difference between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. So of the woman's seed, it's God said, the woman's seed will bruise your head, and thou, the serpent, will bruise his heel. Okay, so this is talking about the spiritual war, and a special seed that is going to be the salvation of humanity in warring against Satan. Once it's revealed the direction of God, Satan thinks in a linear fashion, and he heads right away to destroy whatever the work of God is. Instantly, Satan goes to corrupt all flesh. And one of the ideas that's surrounding this is sort of this um, spiritual genetic engineering, uh, that of 
looking at the angels who had children by the daughters of men. We do see this theme of the Nephilim uh, playing out in this region of time quite a bit. There are pot shots after that and so on, but in this region you just see every culture just being stark scared of whatever these Nephilim are. Also to curve off a little bit of the confusion of this, I think two things are going on at the same time. You have the descendants of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth who are still living 600 years and they have extraordinary lifespans and you frequently hear of stories of so-and-so was given to this or that God, and it could be a man or a woman, uh, so-and-so, and then there are offspring. Well, in this time period where genetics are decreasing, then one mechanism that's happening is people of farther down generations can be given back up to higher generations be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So I think in the idea of ancestral worship, there is one mechanism going on of one type of giant that is related to actual human relations. And then there is another thing like Nephilim that is related to demonic human relations. Two things going on at the same time. So just for confusion's sake, be sure to be thinking in two different dimensions here. I think this is all scrambled, and I think it's all scrambled into astrology and astronomy too. Because astronomy would just be the directions, naming stars after certain supposed gods, and then and then you have astrology, whereby kingdoms start thinking they can control other kingdoms. So they can say, go out there and be a hero. If you're a great enough hero, then your life will be marked as a star. You will become one of those stars in heaven. So then they start worshiping their ancestors, putting that with the heavenly bodies, and you have astrology developing. So I think all those things are happening at the same time. You see the same thing happen, the, the same idea is present with Epic of Gilgamesh and Acadia. The theme pops up. It just comes up over and over and over again. But anyway, it seems like there is an actual genetic engineering plan of Satan to destroy mankind. There is another confusion also, and that is of really big people. We can look at the writing for Richard Lionheart. Uh, Richard Lionheart, he's in England and about at the end of the Holy Wars, the end of the Crusades. So about 1200, let's... Richard the Lionheart. So of Richard the Lionheart, there is a poem written about him. This King Richard, one understand, ere he went out of England. Let's make an axe for the nuns, therewith to cleave the serres and bones. The head in sooth was wrought full wheel, thereon were twenty pound of steel. And when he came in Cyprus land, that Ilken axe he took in hand. So that's a cute little poem that's written about Richard Lionheart over here in England, having traveled back and forth between Britain and then in the Crusades, trying to allow access to the Western world and to Israel. Um, that 20-pound axe, it seems big, but it doesn't seem really big. You know what I mean? I mean, when we're talking about big human or big giant, of Hercules is written here, Yet for all this no man reputeth Hercules or Corineus for giants, albeit that Hanueli in his Architrinian make the later to be twelve cubits in height, which is full eighteen foot, if poetical license do not take place in his report and assertion. I think that's funny, too, to see that the struggle that people are having. Can somebody actually be 18 feet tall? I mean, that is that is really big. A, a basketball player, seven-something feet tall, right? Um, so when you're talking about an 18-foot person, that is huge. I mean, um, Gilgamesh, supposedly 17 feet tall, he meets Utanapishtim, uh, a form of Noah, and says... Noah is just like me. So maybe Noah is 17 feet tall. I don't know. But it's really hard to grasp the, the very concept of that. 
because that is, it's not just big, I mean, that's just giant, just like the word is, gargantuous. And the Nephilim are definitely found throughout Scripture. So we can go into the Hebrew context and the, the Bible context here in the Middle East. Uh, in Jude, Jude has one chapter, and in it, it is said, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So there are some angels, and that word is angelos, the Greek word, when it talks about their own habitation, that's like this eternal habitation, this place that we are going to be going to after we die, and we are changed. We're going up into our new habitation. So it turns out these angels came from their own habitation. So this gets a little bit weird, right? I mean, we do see this theme going on. Also in Second Peter chapter 2, it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned. See, there's another thing, too, because you could have a question when you're seeking into spiritual-minded stuff. You say, can angels sin? Can angels break the commandment of God? And you see here that angels sinned, and then God cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. The theme is there. Uh, again, uh, Peter talking in 1 Peter chapter 3, talking about Christ and going down to 1 Peter 3.19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient. Uh, and you go on talking about the days of Noah. So that would be an allusion to Genesis chapter 6 again. And that word spirits in prison, pneuma. So Nephilim is a, a very interesting word. And then we see this other word that's Raphaim. Uh, kind of similar, but you have the R at the beginning instead of the N. And read down in Genesis chapter 14. If we go back to our, our timeline, we can, we can get a, a spectrum of that, that other dimension. Because we're, in Genesis 14, we're talking about the time of Abraham, which is about 2000 and a little before that, uh, Abraham's life. That's a Masoretic text date. And we can read down in verse 5. It says, And smote the Rephaims in Ashtoreth Karnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in Shava, and it goes on. But there's this word, and it's translated giant. It comes up a number of times. So we have two different descriptions, and we have this theme popping up. Rephaim and Nephilim. So we go in here to the time of Aaron and Moses. And that's something like 1500, 1400 BC, talking about Masoretic text dates. And, and they're about to take over the land that's promised them, which has now been taken over by the Canaanite. All right, so here we can see the Canaanites just setting up shop right here where Shem has been given land. And so, like I said before, part of God's plan is revealed, and then... Satan moves in to destroy God's plan. So here we can see the map with the Canaanites, and somehow the Rephaim and possibly Nephilim are somehow intertwined into this region which Abraham has been promised by God. So now we have the conflict again. So the Israelites are supposed to be going into the promised land. They send out 12 spies. Ten of them come back and they give that very bad report that pastors always like to talk about. Uh, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Well, when I see something like that, I don't think that these people were just a little bit big and they had 20-pound axes. I think these people were really big. You know, they were so big that they were scaring everybody away. Um, and when you think back to the time of Nimrod and a little after with uh, Uruk and Gilgamesh in, in uh, times of old, you had these city-states that were governed by somebody really big. Like if Gilgamesh was 17 feet tall, uh, you kind of hope you're protected in your city, and so each city may have a hero. So it's set up in this way that 
if you don't have a hero that's protecting you, you're probably somebody's slave. Some other city is just going to drag you off and then take you to their city. Their, their city is going to be bigger, and then you're going to have that person as your hero. So Gilgamesh is not that great of a guy, uh, though he thinks very highly of himself. But there he is, and that's how the, the cities are set up. They're, it's almost like their nuclear bomb is a deterrent for anybody attacking them, as look at how big our guy is. And so when you get into this time of, of conquest of Israel, the Israelites, they say, you know what? Um, I don't know about that. No, nah, those people are really big. The sons of Anak, they are really big people. So you go on to Joshua chapter 12, same thing. Og of Bashan. It says, Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnants of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof. And a cubit is a, about 18, 19, 20, 21 inches, somewhere in there, depending upon how you're defining it. I kind of think of it as 18 inches because it makes the math easy because I can just multiply it by 1.5. Six cubits would be nine feet, or 10 cubits would be 15 feet. So when it's talking about nine cubits, it gives you an, an idea. So Joshua going on in, in chapter 15. Joshua 15, sons of Anak. Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak away. They are named. And a lot of this is a picture of how God wants us to think of him as bigger than the giants. You have normal people driving away giants. The giants might be three times their size. We talked about Goliath before, but Goliath also had brothers. A little before 1000 BC in the time of Saul and David, Philistines had yet war again with Israel, 2 Samuel 21. Ishbibinab, which was of the sons of the giant, 2 Samuel 21. We have some named giants here again. Shebechai, the Hushethite. And remember, we're right here, somewhere around 1000 BC. Samuel 21, and there was yet battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature and had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. So just like we are struggling with these, Raphael Holinshed also struggled with these, and you, you see that he quotes, Moses, the prophet of the Lord, writing of the estate of things before the flood, hath these words in his book of generations. In these days, saith he, there were giants upon the earth. Barosus also, the Chaldee, writeth, that near unto Libanus there was a city called Oinan, which I take to be Hanak, built sometime by Ham. See, so he's still quoting and still grappling with this. Holinshed comes up with a whole section in his book talking about giants. It's, it's quite extensive, and he talks plenty of different giants in different places. We have in Spain a giant that Holinshed talks about. And Holinshed has quite a few sources, but he says, Giant of Spain that died of late years by a fall upon the Alps. I think that's funny, you know, you, you wonder if cats ever slip on ice or things like that, and then you have this description, you know, oh, even giants slip off the mountains. <laughs> and they find his body, and here's this dead giant. Do giants slip on banana peels? Maybe. So Holinshed is trying to make the argument that he believes giants do exist. And he says, that all is not absolute untrue, which is remembered of men in such giants. Man full 10 or 11 foot high. Now we've heard of the Trojan War and Ajax. What a name. Yeah, so Ajax right here. Ah, we'll just... We will just remember that the Trojan War is right here, this little red mark. Uh, Ajax was in that war, one of the heroes, as the Trojans and the Greeks each had their heroes. And of Ajax, and Pausanias writes, the body of Ajax was found, the world bone of his knee was adiuged, so broad as a pretty dish. And see the other body of Asterius, 
10 cubits, so that would be like 15 feet possibly. Just fascinating. Report after report. Holland said that's over here in Britain and starts talking about the Persians because he starts talking about uh, Xerxes. Xerxes, who was six common cubits of stature. See, so that would be nine feet. Pretty big guy. Arthracius, a captain in the host of Xerxes, a full remembered whose height was within four fingers breadth of five cubits. So that's seven and a half feet. And so on to the said Pliny addeth that the body of Orestes was seven cubits in length. Wow. And one Gabara of Arabia, nine foot nine inches. Say all that because that's an interesting chapter when you're talking about the history of the world. Uh, it's hard to muster such things, but then why are such things listed in the Bible? So I always have a uh, curiosity for this, not to dismiss everybody's history just because they start talking about giants. Uh, university would dismiss that, but I also feel like I'm not getting all the information. Yeah, so this time where we're talking about Albion and Samothes meeting up with Brutus here, a little bit before 1000 BC, maybe 1100 BC. Very interesting, very fascinating. And even going on to Merlin, Merlin is uh, about like 450, 500 AD. Merlin is said to be a Nephilim. So the theme goes on and on. It's, uh, uh, it sparks the imagination. I mean, this is really insane. So looking at history and then trying to go back as far as we can, we start running into all this stuff that's just mind-bending. If there were giants in England, wouldn't that explain Stonehenge just a little bit more? I went to the United Kingdom at one time, and the locals there would every once in a while say, some people say giants put those stones there. So it's almost like this hush-hush thing with the locals. They kind of like tweaking people, and then they know that some people believe giants existed, and they know at the same time some people don't. Uh, leave it up to you. I think the whole idea is downright provocative. So there was this guy that was prophesied, the seed of the woman. Do we follow that seed of the woman who's prophesied to crush the head of Satan? Or do we follow the seed of the serpent? I think that's the question. I know who I will be following. It's my goal to make this world the best world it can possibly be. So remember, in two days, tomorrow will be yesterday. So do the best you can today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in the next video.